I'm getting the wave. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. And for those at home, so glad that you're with us. Please make a note on your Connect card, uh, I mean on your comments at home. Let us know who's there and where you're watching from. And I, for you, we have run out of Connect cards, I, so I've got to make some more. So we'll catch you next week on that. So, um, but so glad everybody is here today. And a, a couple of announcements that I just want to run through. Next week is very important to remember what? Spring forward. Actually, it's fine if you don't, because I can, I'll have you some things for you to do. We need, you know, things cleaning and stuff in the sanctuary here. So if you come in early, that's okay. I'll, I'll have some things for you to do so you won't miss anything. But next Saturday, please move your clock ahead. You, unfortunately, you lose an hour of sleep. So um, our March book of the year is going to, our book of the year, book of the month is going to be the gifts of imperfection. And the information is there in your bulletin for you at home. It's a book by Brene Brown. And if anybody would like, um, need me to order it, it's on Kindle, it's available on Amazon. Uh, but if you would like me to order it for you, please let me know and I'll be glad to do that for you. Um, so we'll be having that. And uh, so glad that, that we just have a time to be together as a family. I am very sorry to let you know that one of our uh, members has died. Clyde Risser died um, this week, and his service will be Tuesday at 3 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Social distancing and masks will be required for that. But um, please keep Barbara in your prayers during this difficult time for her. But I am so glad each of us is here. I invite our friends at home, if you'll get your candle out, Let's light our candle as we begin our time of worship. Good morning. We're going to start our service this morning with Your Grace is Enough. Now, this is uh, an upbeat song, so if you're at home, make sure you turn up that Bluetooth device or you turn up your TV. And... Um, this is by um, Matt Mayer's version of Your Grace is Enough. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. Nothing can keep us apart So remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, O oh God Your grace is enough Your grace is enough your grace is enough for me. Make your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to be the strong. Go ahead and stop this because the sound is just not working out at all. So go ahead and stop it. And I'm gonna just kind of um, talk you about talk to you about this song. Um, this song is about God's grace being just enough for you. Whatever you have in your life that that that's going on, whatever the kind of forgiveness that you need. Whatever it is that you're looking for to move you on to the next step that you need to move on to get past something, that's all you need to do is to, to look for God's grace. 
So I'm just going to end it with that. And there's, uh, we'll, we'll work on the sound system here with, with this, and uh, we'll go from there. So, Pastor. Thank you, Dave. Where's the... Well, we're just doing really well today, aren't we? Is it April 1st yet? So, are we... Are you ready for it? Okay. I'm going to ask all of you now to to be in a prayerful way of receiving, receiving God, receiving the Holy Spirit. As you listen to this um, clip that's going on, I want you just to hear her words. Because we are all in this time of Lent, in this season of walking through the wilderness. A time of, of recognizing our need of God. Of the the bleakness of life without Jesus. And so, as you listen to this meditation, just allow God to speak to you. A Wilderness Meditation You wonder how long How long will this wilderness journey last? Myriads have asked this question before you. The wilderness is where I form you as individuals, as leaders, as a community. It is in the wilderness that you learn to rely on me for all that you need. It is in the wilderness that I provide water out of the rock, meat out of the sky, and manna from heaven. It is in the wilderness that I have given you my commandments. It is in the wilderness that you have learned to be a community. How long, you ask? As long as it takes. This is a time to breathe deeply. This is a time to explore all that is around you. This is a time to learn to love and serve in different ways, even to worship without all the trappings of a church building. Your reliance on me is to be total. And yet, you have taken the burden upon yourselves. You have allowed yourself to be weighed down by all the new responsibilities of life in this wilderness. You have been so busy, learning to worship in new ways, learning to disciple in new ways, learning to order the life of the church in new ways. The burden you have taken upon yourselves is heavy. I did not intend for this to be your wilderness burden. I want you to trust me, to rely on my provision, to see a more simple way of being in my presence and in the presence of others. I want you to pause and to survey the landscape in the wilderness. Yes, it is rocky and dusty and dry. But have you not seen what I can do with the dust of the earth? Have I not taken dust and created life, breathing my life-giving Holy Spirit into these new beings? Have you not seen what I can do with ashes, how once marked as a sign of repentance, of literally turning around, a new way becomes possible? Have you not seen what I can do with dry bones? Can you not hear the rattling as each bone comes together and I breathe new life into them? Have you not seen what I can do in the desert? How streams can flow and flowers can bloom 
even in the desert. Lay down your burdens now. Lay them at my feet. You were not meant to be beasts of burden. You were not meant to be slaves in Egypt. You were born to be free, free to love life to its fullest, free to love others and to show them this new life. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Don't you long for my rest? Then stop and enjoy this wilderness journey. How long, you ask? As long as it takes. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, you know the journey each one of us is on. You know the difficulties that we face, the trials, the dryness, isolation. We may be saying, how long, Lord? How long can we bear this? Can we go through the difficulties? They are just too heavy for us. But you remind us that we do not walk alone, that you are with us, that you help carry us. Help us, Lord, to, to give our burdens to you, to seek the forgiveness that you offer, to call out your name, to be vulnerable. How long, Lord? How long before we call your name? Lord, there's so many people struggling today. You know the cries that each of you hear, that you hear from each of us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will touch all those that are needing of healing, healing of both body and of soul. We pray your arms of compassion are around those grieving the loss of loved ones. We pray that you show the opportunities, those open doors for, for people that just feel like life has hit a dead end. For those struggling to pay bills, feed their family. We ask your forgiveness, Lord, for the many times we turn our back on you when we think we can do it better. And we pray, Lord, as a community of faith for this church that we can truly listen to your leading, can share the hope that you give us, Jesus, with all that we see and in everything that we do. Feed us, empower us, show us the way, Lord. <clears throat> It is with the confidence of your people that we join our voices together everywhere. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to try it over here this time. Uh, this song is by uh, Big Daddy Weave. It's called Jesus, I Believe. This is a, a new one. It's the first time we've done this one. Um, and this is all about faith again. Um, faith about 
letting God's kingdom come. And that doesn't mean the end of the world. It just means just letting God's kingdom come and letting it rule in your life.
Would you pray for me as I pray for you? Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful everywhere. Open our hearts and our minds to receive the particular message that you have for each one of us today. And I pray, Lord, that the words I say are not my own, but are yours. Amen. Well, we are halfway through our, our sermon series this Lent season as we look at hope from healing. The hope that we find in healing. And we've looked at a couple of different ways that we see that healing. We looked at the healing of love and communities. We've looked at the traps of anxiety as we heal those. And last week, we talked about the scars of sin. Today, we're going to look at that hope and healing in terms of shame. Shame. Now, I'm going to define shame as that strong emotion that we feel that, that really causes us to feel defective. It causes us to feel unacceptable feel damaged. It's that, it's that belief that we are unworthy. Now, we've all experienced guilt, and guilt is a little different from shame. Guilt has to do with our behaviors, the things that we do. We all, we all feel guilty, or may, I, maybe I'm making an assumption, but Everybody has felt, felt guilty over something, something that we did or didn't do. Like, um, I feel guilty if I don't, haven't called my mom. Or maybe somebody feels guilty because they've shared gossip that hurt somebody. Or maybe if we feel guilty when we had an opportunity to help somebody and we don't. Those are those sense of guilt of things that we do. Shame is a little different. Shame says to us, instead of, I made a mistake, like guilt, shame says that I'm flawed. The reason I do the wrong things is because of me, that I am a bad person a defective person. So instead of the actions, it gets turned back on self. That feeling of unworthiness that permeates what we do. Brene Brown, who in the book that we're going to be reading this month in the book club, The Gifts of Imperfection, she talks about a shame storm a shame storm. And she says this, when, when she does something or, and she feels that sense of shame, she says, when the shame winds are whipping around me, it's almost impossible to hold on to any perspective or to recall anything good about myself. I go right into the bad self-talk of saying, God, I'm such an idiot. Why did I do that? So what does our faith have to say about how we deal with shame and what it is? So we're going I think the first place we need to look at is the first incident of shame in the Bible. And that comes in Genesis 3 in our in the second creation story. So let me give you a little summary of what's going on before I start with our actual scripture. In the second story, Adam has been created from dust, and God has created this beautiful, wonderful Eden that has everything Adam could possibly want. And God says, this is yours, but don't eat from the one tree, the tree of truth and life, of knowing what's right and wrong. But everything else is yours and it's wonderful. 
And then he decides to create a helper, a partner for, um, for Adam. At this point, he's still called the man and the woman, but we know them as Adam and Eve. And he creates Eve. And then that's where we start. We're going to pick up, pick up where we're, you know what? Okay, I brought my glasses somewhere. Okay, this may be a short read. I'm going to read it from up there. <laughs> so when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for fruit and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God, and he, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to them. He called to the man saying, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So here we hear in this story, a lot of things going on that really help us understand how we deal with shame. In this story, there are two aspects. Two aspects that we follow into, just as Adam and Eve did. They are blame and hide. So let's start with the blame first. When God asked Adam, what did you do? What did he say? It's her fault. Well, actually, he even blames God a little bit. The woman you put in this garden, so he gives a little to God too, she gave it to me. And when he talked to the woman, well, wait, the serpent, the serpent, he convinced me. It's his fault. What do we do with that? How many of us have blamed people for things that, that we've done? Things that we feel? Tool is a, I mean, blame is a tool that we use to deflect those feelings of unworthiness. Those feelings that, that we don't want to take responsibility for. It's that shame storm that we are trying to, to get away from. Well, instead of saying what's wrong with me, it's easier and it feels better to say what's wrong with them. It's their fault. Can you think of times when you've done that? When things have happened and, and immediately start to shift to look for who to blame. So you don't have to think about our part and what's going on and, and feel those feelings of unworthiness. Do we say, God, why did you put me in this position? Why didn't you get me out of this situation? Because we're pretty good at blaming God sometimes too. I have a card I found in the store I love. I love, I love. And so on the front of the card, you can't see it, but there's a clergyman, and he's got his collar, so you know he's clergy. And a police has pulled him over and is sitting there writing a ticket. 
And he goes, Reverend, have you been drinking? Just water, officer. And the inside, the officer says, then why do I smell wine? And the clergyman goes, good Lord, he's done it again. It's easy to convince ourselves and blame God, isn't it? It is easy to deflect our shame and our sense of unworthiness by putting it on others. The second thing we saw with Adam and Eve is they learned to hide. As soon as they saw their nakedness, what did they do? They hid. What are some other ways of hiding that go on? Besides the physical running around and getting behind something, there are so many ways that we hide in our lives. And I want to look at another story in the Bible to talk about that hiding. In John 4, 1 through 30. And I want you this week to read that passage at some point. It's a story of the, the woman at the well. And I want you to read it and think about shame and hiding and how you relate to this woman as you work through what some of what this means for you. John 4, 1 through 30. And here we have Jesus. He's traveling through Samaria. And Samaria is that place that that um, a good, respectable Jew would never be found because there's a lot of judgment, a lot of prejudice towards Samaritans, that they're second-class Jews. They are not of the same level. And people, if you're a good-standing Jew, you, you don't want to be seen with Samaritans. Jesus doesn't care. And he's going on his journey, and he's walking through Samaria to get to Jerusalem. And while he's there, it comes at noontime, and he stops at a well, and he's thirsty, and he, but he doesn't have anything to get water from the well with, so he just sits and rests, and this woman comes to the well at noon. And that tells us a little bit about this woman, because all the women come in the early morning, and the evening and the coolness of the time, that's when they come to gather and get their water for the day and for their family. It's a social time where you come, sort of like gathering at the water cooler in the office, where you find out what's going on and you're talking and you're glad to see everybody. The fact that she comes alone at noon means there is shame in her life that she's hiding she doesn't want to see them. They don't, and he probably even more doesn't want them to see her. And as Jesus talks to her, he, he talks and he lets her know, I know, I know you've had five husbands. I know that the person that you're living with now is not your husband. I know all about your life and what you're ashamed of. And I want to talk with you. Would you give me water? which is a huge thing that a Jew uh, of good standing would ask a Samaritan word woman to help him and to give him water. So we hear that Jesus talks with her, and after he's talked with her, she is so filled with joy and so filled with acceptance and grace that she goes out and she doesn't care who she sees. She begins to tell them about Jesus and this gift of grace that he's given her. Shame encourages us to hide. We avoid people. Now, in this past year, that's been pretty easy to do. If you want to hide this past year, it has not been a problem. But that when we hide for shame, from shame, it's a different kind of thing. 
When we're hiding from people, we can do it beside physically hiding. We can hide by, by overworking ourselves, staying at office. We can hide by uh, excessive work at the workouts at the gym, out running, anything. There's many ways of hiding. We can hide in our, our hobbies. We can hide in our children by focusing on them and getting so focused on everything is for them that it keeps us from focusing ourselves or people to see the damaged self that we see. We hide in the internet. We hide in Netflix. We hide in ESPN. We hide in so many things. We put up facades that we want people to see. And we work really hard to hold them up so that people can't see the damaged person that's behind it. We hide in humor. We hide in procrastination. We hide in righteous anger. We spend a lot of time and energy hiding. And I have to tell you, in my first career as a counselor, I made my living off of people hiding, hiding from their shame and their guilt. Because there are a lot of people doing that. The Bible tells us of many stories throughout of people who went through times of shame and yet they were the people that the church ended up being built on. Paul, Paul who persecuted Christians and even Jesus, and yet found this amazing forgiveness. We think of Peter, Peter who denied Jesus three times before he went to the cross. And yet when Jesus came to him and showed him his scars and said, you're the one, the you're the rock the church is going to be built on. And Mary Magdalene, Jesus knew of her past. And there are so many people. And the reason that they were excited about Jesus and Christ is because they knew the, about the joy of forgiveness of shame being wiped away. And they wanted other people to know that. And it's the same for us. When we know that shame, when we understand what true forgiveness through Christ means, we're excited and we want to tell other people, we want them to know that this is for them too. So today we have this, this powerful image or message of, about grace that comes from the garden and comes from a well. This message that, that Jesus has given to all of us. And in the garden, remember, they were hiding and Jesus talked and God talked to them. But in verse 21, listen to what he said is, and does. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Clothed them. Even though he was disappointed in them, even though they had, had just done everything wrong and they were feeling the shame, God showed grace and clothed them. And by doing that said, I love you no matter what. I love you no matter what. And the woman at the well, to finally have a sense of self-worth that changed who she was and changed how she saw herself in the world so that she didn't mind going out and being around people and for people to see her because she had the joy of Christ that was radiating from her instead of shame. We all have to struggle with our own shame. 
We all still have to face the consequences of behavior as they did. But when we know that Jesus is there to help us and to carry the burden with us, and that that grace is there, reminding us that we are not damaged, not damaged in Jesus' eyes. We are so many of us tied down with the burden of our shame, we, with things that we wished we had never said and wished we had never done, or maybe even wished that we had done something, sometimes a shame from our lack of actions is heavy as well. But that's as we look toward Easter, that's where our hope comes from. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is reminding Jesus' words to him. He said, Jed, my grace is sufficient for you. This is Jesus talking to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That was a message that Paul, Paul always heard. Always from the teachings that he knew of Jesus. So as we conclude and start to move toward communion, I want each of you to, to take a moment to close your eyes, to think about some sort of burden of shame that you carry right now. Feel the weight of that burden, the weight of that shame. And I want you to see Jesus standing in front of you. And he says your name. And he extends his nail-scarred hands toward you. And he says, give your shame to me. Give your shame to me. And when we hesitate and we pull back, he says a little bit louder, says our name and says, let go, let go. My friends, now is the time for us to release that shame and that burden, all that we carry, and to accept the hope, to accept the hope of forgiveness and grace that has been promised to us from Jesus. That is the hope and joy of Easter. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. You've heard our, our sighs, our cries, our worries. We thank you for accepting each of us. No matter who we are, you're saying to each one of us that you love us that you forgive us. Thank you. Amen. I invite all of us to begin to prepare for communion. Those here in the sanctuary have received your communion bag. Those at home, I hope you have your, your bread and your um, juice ready. I'm going to invite everyone after the, to wait until after the liturgy. And then at that point, we will all take our bread together and all take our, our uh, drink together. Jesus gathered with his disciples on that last supper as he was heading toward the cross. And he took ordinary bread from the table. 
He lifted it up and gave thanks to God. And he broke it. And said to his disciples, as he says to us, this is my body poured out for you, broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance. And through this act, we remember our own personal brokenness and the healing act and the gift of grace. <clears throat> and then he took a cup from the table, lifted it up and gave thanks to God. And he said to his disciples and to all of us, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Oh, Holy Spirit, as we gather here today to receive this gift of bread and, and juice, may it be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ who died to offer us grace and forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts and receive this gift, not only as we eat and drink, but to heal our hearts. Amen. So I invite all of us to take the bread, reminds us of the brokenness of Christ, this is a bread broken for you. And we remember the blood poured out for us. This is the blood poured for us, our cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. I'm going to ask Gary to come up and help us with this last song a little bit. This is uh, just a closer walk with thee. So I'd like you to stand and I'd like you to clap if you're at home. Stand and clap along. Thou art strong Jesus keep me from a wrong I'll be satisfied as long Oh as I walk Let me walk Close to thee Just a closer walk with thee Grant in Jesus this I plead Daily walking close to thee Oh, let it be Dear Lord, let it be This world of toils and snares If I fall the Lord who cares Who with me my burden shares None but thee dear Lord none But life is o'er Time for me will be no more Guide me gently, 
Savior to thy kingdom shore to thy kingdom shore just a closer walk with thee grant Jesus this I plead Daily walking close to Thee, oh let it be, dear Lord, let it be. One more time, just a closer walk with Thee. Friend, and Jesus is my plea. participating. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. And now, as you go out this week, remember that Christ walks with you and is wanting to carry the burdens that you're carrying. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his what? His peace. This day and forevermore, and all God's people everywhere said, Amen. Let it be, dear Lord.